Good evening, and uh, thank you for coming. It looks like a pretty full house, which is terrific. For you've got a. We're excited tonight to welcome you to the DGA. It's presented by the African American Steering Committee. Many of you know, and those of you who have heard me say this before, sorry, I'm going to say it again, um, the African American Steering Committee is a vital and integral part of the DGA, um, and it has been since 1980. In 1984, the committee reformed and re-energized, and they've been putting on events like this ever since. It's also been the starting point for many members who now participate in other aspects of the Guild, as elected or appointed members of the board and councils, the negotiations committees, and the creative rights committee, to name a few. Their voice and experience is a vital and necessary contribution to this great guild. And as an example, a former chair of the AASC, and now our president, not Obama, uh, Paris Barkley, <laughs> who, who who, uh, who really wanted to be here tonight, but he had made a prior commitment that he couldn't get out of, and he, he really, he really um, uh, is sad that he can't be here. He wanted to pay tribute to Gina, and he sends his regards to, to Gina and to everybody here. Um, you're going to hear a lot tonight about Gina, but let me add a few words. Uh, Gina's talent is not bound by any single genre or format. She's been a leading light in film and television, in dramedy, in dramedy, <laughs> in drama and comedy. You can tell I'm not a public speaker. Um, a perfect example is the recent announcement that she'll be shaking up the superhero blockbuster world. <laughs> by directing Marvel's Silver and Black for the big screen. So we're excited about that. Tonight, D Gina joins an esteemed group who's already been celebrated by the AASC throughout the years at this annual event. That includes people like Sidney Poitier, Maya Angelou, Lee Daniels, Tim Story, Richard Pryor, Bill Duke, F. Gary Gray, Ivan Dixon, Wendell Franklin, Melvin Van Peebles, Debbie Allen, Stan Lathan, who I think is here, I saw him earlier, yeah. and Gordon Parks. That's a pretty impressive company to be in, and Gina's just getting started. Gina, the DGA salutes you on this very special evening. Uh, and now please join me in welcoming to the stage uh, two of my favorite people in the DGA, uh, the AASC co-chairs, Jeff Bird and Courtney Franklin. Oh, that's so sweet, Brian. We, we paid him to say that. I, I did not know. What's up, everybody? What's up? All right, listen. So first of all, this is going to be a fun night. So it's not the stick in the chair night. It's not the, you know, this is a fun night because Gina is a immensely fun human being. So I don't want anybody thinking, okay, it's one of these kind of claps or any of that stuff. It's, 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 it's a yeah. rousing yeah. applause. It's a rousing applause. This is when you're at the movie and you're talking to the movie. Yes. That's what this that's, night is. That's what this night is because you know what? We know how we do it. Exactly. Nobody in this room has, everybody in this room has said, oh, I'm going to play you for your heart. Everyone has said that to someone. <laughs> all right? And that's thanks to Gina prince Bythewood. So just know that. Number one. So welcome to the Directors Guild of African Americans. That's tonight. That's our night. That's what we're doing. I, I, I know it's America, but it's a, the African Americans are here tonight. So I want, I want to thank you guys for coming out and, and helping us celebrate Gina Prince Bythewood. And I, I'm sorry, I get excited because, you know, I've known Gina for a while and I, and I know Reggie and, you know, I mean, it's just a wonderful thing that we could be doing this, especially in light of everything that's going on in the world. So Absolutely. just just feel free to stop me, Courtney, at whatever time because <laughs> I, can, I can just go on and on. So. Well, I was going to say, you know it's the night of the African Americans when the co-chair, one got dreadlocks, one got natural hair. We're not playing around tonight. Yes, that's okay. That's, that's, that's we we came to be serious. That's you know? where we're at. And I got to tell you, of course, our two co-chairs, and John Singleton is our third co-chair. He couldn't be here tonight, but of course, he sends his regards as well. He sends his love. Well. He sends his love, for um, sure. He's out getting our next job. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Ka-ching. Ka-ching. <laughs> So, okay, so, well, Brian gave you a little bit of the history of the ASC and um, what we're about. Um, but real quick, before we, you know, just totally dig into Gina, I want all of my AASC members that come to the meetings and are there month after month, please stand up real quick so they can know who you are. AASC in the house, stand up, stand up. Yeah, everyone we definitely want to thank everybody everyone for their hard this. work and putting this together. Okay, wait a minute, so stay standing real quick. So every director 
that is of African American heritage who is in the DGA, please stand up too. Every DGA director who is African American, please stand up. Yeah. Yes. Okay, y'all should be coming to the meetings. Y'all come to the next meeting. <laughs> we miss y'all. Y'all need to come to the next meeting. All That's y'all. Right. All, all of y'all that stood up and just come to the meetings and just keep it keep it coming. Just just then there's that there's that. Okay, you know no big. Just just saying. Just saying. Now that Jeff got the shaming out of the way. Yes. Um, tonight we are very thrilled, of course, to honor the work and celebrate the career of an incredible woman, mother, friend, collaborator, writer, producer, and last but not least, director. Yes, you know? yes, Black Wonder Woman. That's right. Black Wonder Woman. In Jenny this Prince room. Bisewood. Black Wonder Woman. In this woman. room. Black Girl Magic, yes, but Black Wonder Woman, hell yes. <laughs> Now, her work speaks volumes in showcasing the human experience, and it is a real privilege for us to be able to recognize Gina tonight. Now, she's an inspiration and an example of perseverance in this industry. Yes, and uh, actually with that said, we should see some of that genius and perseverance on the screen. So let us roll the footage, people. Cool. That brought back some memories, right? I know I'm going to go home and pull out my love and basketball DVD tonight. I'm just saying. Um, there's one thing that she said in that clip that I want everybody to, to listen to, and that is when you want something, ask for it. Don't wait for somebody to give it to you. Don't wait for someone to offer it to you. If there's something that you want, ask for it. And I think... I think it was just very inspirational to hear that and to be reminded of that. So if you don't take anything away tonight in terms of what you can do to support yourself, take that away. Ask for what you want. Now, I'd now like to welcome to the stage an extremely talented actor from playing Monica Wright in Love and Basketball. <laughs> Alexa Woods and one of my personal favorites, Alien vs. Predator. We forget about that one, but that, that's, that's my jam. And you all, of course, may have seen her lately in the, her No Prisoners role in TV series Shots Fired. Please welcome Sanaa Lathan. Hi. Hi, Gina. Watching those scenes in Loving basketball and disappearing act. It looked like it was shot in 1960. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I met Gina in 1997. I had just started my professional career as an actress. I had been in LA two years and I was feeling myself. I had done a guest spot on Family Matters with Urkel. I played LL Cool J's date on In the House. And I had just shot a very intense interrogation scene on NYPD Blue. I was surely a drug dealer's girlfriend. <laughs> One day, I was hanging out with my new friend, Hill Harper. I think we had just gone on a hike or something in Silver Lake. And we went back to his place. It was late afternoon. <sighs> no, we weren't dating. Just friends. And I get a page. I get a, a 911 page <laughs> on my pager <laughs> to call my agent. I call my agent, and um, she told me about this stage reading of this script, and they needed an emergency replacement because the lead actress got sick and had to fall out. And um, the, the reading was in two days, and the rehearsal was the following day. And I, you know, I mean, coming from theater, I could do stage readings with my eyes closed, <laughs> you know. But it wasn't, it wasn't paying, and, you know, I think I had plans that weekend. So just as I was about to say no, Hill, who I guess was listening, um, said, no, 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 I know this script and I know, I know who wrote it and I think you should do it, it's really good. And I was like, really? And he was like, yeah. 
And I was like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll do them this favor. Just, you know, <laughs> just send me the script and the address and I'll show up. And my agent said, oh, no, no, no. Um, uh, the writer needs to talk to you first before she, you, 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 she gives you the job. And I was like, okay. So um, I get on the phone with this soft-spoken woman named Gina Prince. And long story short, she tells me that she needs me to audition that night. <laughs> and I was like, I thought to myself, I was like, audition? <laughs> I was like, I'm doing you a favor. Like, who are you? You know, and, and just as I was about to say no again, Hill, must have been overhearing again, said, um, you know what, I have an idea. Why don't you ask her to come to here, come to my house, and I'll read with you. And that way, you know, it's meeting you halfway. And, uh, and I said, okay, okay. And then I suggested it to her, and she agreed. And then an hour later, in walks Gina Prince and Reggie Bythewood. Cute couple. <laughs> and um, they, they proceed to sit on Hill's couch, and Hill and I proceed to read two or three scenes from this script with this corny title called Love and Basketball. I played Monica, Hill played Quincy. Hill was acting his ass off, by the way. <laughs> I mean, I was like, well, damn, is this my audition or yours? <laughs> anyway, so we finished the reading and Gina whispered to Reggie. They stepped outside to discuss it and like an hour later came in and, and offered me the part of Monica. And that night, I, I went home and I, I read Love and Basketball for the very first time. And I got scared. <sighs> I didn't want to cry. <laughs> this woman's script was masterful. I laughed, I cried, I cheered, I swooned all by myself in my bed in my little apartment. <laughs> um, I was on the edge of my seat. I was struck with awe at the um, mastery of this woman's vision. And I got scared because what if I had said no? <laughs> and then cut to a couple days later, we do the stage reading in this theater on a stage, sitting in chairs with the scripts on our laps to a very captivated audience. And um, fun fact, Mackay Pfeiffer played Quincy in that reading. Hill wasn't very happy about that. <laughs> um, and it went really well. And then a year later, Gina got the, her deal to make Love and Basketball into a movie. And I was very fortunate because Gina and the producers had had an idea in their head that they wanted to hire a direct, I mean, a, hire a, a, a basketball player who could act as opposed to an actress who they could teach to play basketball. But I, I, she gave me a shot because I had done the reading. And after one of the most grueling audition experiences of my life, Gina gave me the gift of Monica Wright. Um, don't let that shy smile fool you, though. Um, Gina doesn't play when it comes to fulfilling her vision. Being on that set, I learned that Gina will not stop until she gets exactly what she wants. Take after take after take. She pushed me way outside of my comfort zone. Uh, every moment was so thought out and so specific. Um, Monica's form, her physicality, her follow through, her, her range of emotions. Every actor, every crew member had to rise to Gina's vision. Um, and just like Monica Wright, who, who came alive on the basketball court, Gina comes alive on the set. And when you watch her, you can tell that this is her life's passion and this is exactly where she is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, here we are 17 years later and there is not a day that goes, I'm just becoming one of those people that cries all the time in my old age. There's not a day that 
goes by that people don't, every, every day somebody comes up to me or on Twitter or, you know, social media, every single day people tell me how much this story means to them. It has touched so many people around the world. I've seen it in Japanese. Um, and it's, you know, different generations, races. Um, it, she has really created a, a, a new classic for the ages. Um, but still, don't let that quiet demeanor fool you. Uh, Gina is a ferocious fighter for what she believes in and one of the most relentlessly determined artists that I know. No wonder she is making history as the first black woman to helm a big budget superhero movie. Mm -hmm. She is a shero to so many. <sighs> she is a dreamer, she is a fighter, she is a storyteller, she is romantic, she is an activist, she is a boss, she is a mother, she is a wife, and she is my friend. <laughs> I am so honored and I am so deeply, deeply grateful for the beautiful characters that she, that you have entrusted me with, Monica and Zora and Badash. And um, I'm just also so grateful for all the stories that you have put into the world and that you will put into the world. And I am so proud of you and I thank you. Love you. Good evening, everyone. How's everybody tonight? This is such a joyous occasion, and those are words we don't use very often under the presidency of President Bam Bam. So thank you, uh, African American Steering Committee, for giving us reason to rejoice. And thank you, Gina, for giving us reason to rejoice. It's such an honor to pay homage to this incredibly talented artist that I had the honor of knowing at the very dawn of her career. 26 years ago, in Hollywood math, 250 years ago, <laughs> a shy but determined, newly minted, UCLA graduate walked into the Different World Writer's Room to begin her writer's apprenticeship. Gina Prince tried very unsuccessfully to camouflage her beauty in a daily uniform of an oversized men's shirt with short sleeves, baggy pants to hide that beautiful behind, and very sensible sandals. I am very glad to see the suede boots. We've, we've moved up in the world, Gina. Your art has evolved as has your style. It's fantastic. We had, uh, of course, it was a 90s sitcom room, so we had our prerequisite contingent of sitcom hacks who would recycle their jokes that they had last used on Three's Company like they were one-size-fits-all bras. And in this sort of creative wilderness, we had this bright light of originality, authenticity, someone who was so insistent on the integrity of character and story arc, this intense young woman. She was fantastic. The only thing she really was dreadful at was editing her own writing. And every time we had to cut lines from one of her scenes, I felt as though I were amputating her limb <laughs> with a buzz saw and no anesthesia. She would wince, visibly in pain. Then she would stand her ground and, and argue with me about the flow and how every line led to the, the moment of the crescendo. And I would say, Gina, we are not doing roots. We are the 21 minute and 56 seconds between soap ads. A sitcom is sex without foreplay. You get to the action. So she would sigh and she would wince 
And you could see her still pained in the booth when we were shooting the scene, but she got over it. But ladies and gentlemen, all those beautiful, languorous, sensuous love scenes, many of them involving Sanaa that we have seen through the years, that's Gina, Gina's revenge. She got her foreplay. It's all on screen. I never minded those discussions with Gina because in her case, they did not come out of ego. She didn't think every word she'd written was gold. They came out of integrity and idealism. Gina believed then and believes now in the perfectibility of art and the perfectibility of humankind. Yes. And in that faith, she, as she mentioned in the beautiful video, met her perfect match in Reggie Rock Bythewood. Magnificent man known to us in the writer's room as baby August Wilson. <laughs> known to me now as the future father-in-law of my gorgeous 14-year-old daughters. Sorry, Marcus and Toussaint, but you're marked. You're marked. Your mother and I have already arranged this. So it, it came as a shock to no one that these two fell in love. They were such partners in art and activism. It was at their insistence, at their passionate insistence, that we opened the sixth season of A Different World with a two-parter that found Dwayne and Whitley in the midst of the Los Angeles riots, which we had just uh, experienced. It's, a, it's an epic episode. It's also the episode that I believe got us canceled. <laughs> Yeah, but I take the opportunity tonight, Reggie and Gina, to say that I hold no grudge. <laughs> the years that I spent working at the perfume counter at Neiman Marcus as the spray lady were among the most fulfilling of my life. <laughs> Seriously, all jesting aside, 25 years after our youthful faith in the inevitability of racial progress was first shattered. It is nothing short of miraculous to see Gina and Reggie respond with the beauty and humanity of shots fired. <laughs> Gina lives by the motto of Zora Neale Hurston. I do not weep at the world. I am too busy sharpening my oyster knife. That kind of idealism, maintaining that idealism, takes strength and grit and a special kind of grace with which Gina has always been imbued. Back during the different world days, she was a young woman in search of herself. She loved her beautiful adoptive parents who are here tonight who raised her and thank you for that the princes, but she longed to know her birth parents, and during the course of the show, she, she got to meet her birth mother, who was a white woman who had been forced at 17 by her racist parents to give Gina up. We sat and listened to this story, and as she told it, we said, what, what did you say to your mother when you met her? And wide-eyed, she said, I said, thank you for giving me life. Well, Gina, I want to echo your words back to you. Thank you for giving new life to our often battered hope. Thank you for reviving our faith that a gifted artist can indeed change the world. And as you take the helm of silver and black, Know that as it's already been mentioned, you are already our Wonder Woman, and we love you. Whoa, how do you, how, how do you follow that real quick? I, I, I don't even want to be up here right now. I'm like, what? Whoa. Oh. Okay, so, um, yeah. So, honestly, though, if you look at the people that have come up on the stage and the people that are to come, that, that are to follow. Um, sadly, we have to look at ourselves, y'all. Check out your team. Gina prince bythewood has got a team, man. she got a squad. So, you know, you got to surround yourself. You have to surround yourself with excellence so you can further your own excellence. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my team now like, what am I? Hey, hey. <laughs> hey. 
What y'all, what y'all, what y'all doing left and right? What y'all, what y'all doing? So, uh, wow. Okay, so um, this next person coming to the stage means a whole uh, a lot to me. Um, I would not have gotten my start in television without her. And it just so happens that she is the best friend of Gina prince Bythewood, And uh, hence the team, the squad, check that out. And um, Felicia has done Gossip Girl, executive produced Gossip Girl, Fringe, and um, created and executive produced The Quad, which is currently on the air on BT now, uh, of which I directed two episodes. Thank you, FDH. Love you. Um, and back in the day, you all know her for, from Soul Food, in which she gave me my start. Ladies and gentlemen, the prolific Felicia D. Henderson. I obviously did not put this evening together because I would not be following Susan Fells Hill if I did. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So I have not ever worked with Gina. When Gina got her start at um, A Different World, I was getting my start at NBC as an executive in the management training program. So I've known her since the beginning of that career. Um, so I'm here to talk about a friendship. Um, and the reason, by the way, we're still friends is because I have never worked with Gina Pence <laughs> Bythewood. So where do I begin, G? I'll begin with Mara, Bra Mara Braca Kill, who really, really wishes she were here tonight. And if she were, we'd be up here making fun of Gina together. But Mara and I and some other girlfriends were planning a trip um, to Jamaica. We were all hardworking and tired and decided we're going to rent a villa. But it was six bedrooms and we were five and we needed one more. So Mara said, one of my really dear friends, Gina Prince, I can ask her. And I said, I know Gina Prince. She's weird. <laughs> She's stuck up. She doesn't really talk. And she seems really impressed with herself. No, she is not our sixth. <laughs> and she said, no, she's just shy. And I was like, OK, she can go. But wherever the rooms are, I want mine as far away from hers as possible. <laughs> and after that, I don't want to have to ever be in her space again. That was about 21 years ago. and. Just yesterday, Gina and Mara and I had breakfast. <laughs> and Gina said, um, so see you tomorrow night. And I said, why am I seeing you tomorrow? She said, you know, the event. And I was like, what freaking event? And she reminded me of this. I said, Gina, I've heard nothing about this in months. You have said, no I think I, I'm on deadline. I'm not, she's like, I, and, and she said, and you're on program. I said, well, take me off the program and I will come. <laughs> And she said, look, go sit in your car for five minutes and come up with something and quit bitching. <laughs> yes. So what is my point? <laughs> I'm her friend. And I want you guys to know some of the things that I know. Gina can be mean. <laughs> I also want you guys to know that one of her favorite songs is I Want It That Way by the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> I want you guys to know that sometimes she writes to Kenny G. Mm -hmm. Mara and I had to talk her out of wearing Birkenstocks to her wedding. <laughs> and at that wedding, that same wedding, Gina and I almost came to blows because she claimed that I purposely kept sticking her in the head with the hairpins when I was doing her hair. <laughs> my goal was only to make sure she looked beautiful enough for my dear friend Reggie Rock. As you guys know, and as you will hear tonight, and as Sana and Susan said, Gina is truly painfully shy. That is still true. 
which is why I'm so in awe of the way she commands a set when she's on it. It is a beautiful thing to behold. <clears throat> but it's also why in a social setting, if you guys are walking to an event together and you're talking like two normal people do when you go to an event together, <laughs> as soon as you get to the door, she'll quickly hop back and push you in your back so that you have to go through the door first. I can't quite get used to that. Oh, and here's another one. If you take a cross-country trip with her, she will put her bare feet on the dash. It grosses me out. Which is why she does it. And when I say, you know what, your white half is really showing now. Mm -hmm. She'll finally take her feet down. <laughs> Gina is also part gangbanger. <laughs> we can be almost anywhere, and for no reason at all, I look over and she'll be like, <laughs> yeah, she throws up the west side on me and tells me Pasadena ain't got nothing on Encino. Yes, but here's what I also want you to know about Gina. If you call her in the middle of the night crying because you maybe have a chronic spine condition that you're freaking tired of, and she says, I'll come over, where are you? And I'm like, and you can say, I'm not in the mood for company. She will figure out that you're really at Cedar sinai She will call Mara and they will come to your room and put on such a show that the nurse kicks them out of the hospital for being so loud. <laughs> Oprah Winfrey once said, lots of people want to ride in you, with you in the limo, but what you want is someone who will take the bus when the limo breaks down. I hate that you started with the cry, Sanaa, because now I have to go, I also won't cry. I recently had a, a death in my family, and Gina had major surgery at the same time that I was dealing with that. And she was like, where are you? I will come to you. And I had to say, no, I think this time I better come to you. And we sat and we laughed, and every time I made her laugh, and I did it on purpose, it hurt. <laughs> but I saw, I will say this, thank you for always being on the bus with me, Gina. You are my ride or die homie. You never ever hesitate to say, is this the day that the limo breaks down? And if it is, I'm with you. I love you so much. Goodness. <clears throat> I'm used to being in a dark room by myself. <laughs> um, I would love to be able to speak without, speak from the heart, but I, I wrote from the heart, so Gina. <clears throat> Gina, I would like to think of our solit solitary time together in the editing room as an island excursion of sorts. So if I was to edit the travel brochure, for our lovely island, it would go a little something like this. Good evening, and welcome to the editing room of Gina Prince Bythewood, <laughs> AKA ILGPB. I am Terry Shropshire, and I live there. Please may I have your attention as I give you a brief but necessary tour on what you can expect if you were ever to be allowed entry. Our editing room is a destination through uncharted waters not easily found on any map. Gina likes it that way. Your access is only granted in the spirit of creativity, cooperation, and progress. No impedance is allowed in her flow. What's that? Did she hear a no in the wind? <laughs> the wind's no better than to blow a no that way. You better come prepared 
with your A game, your best skills, and a willingness to leave it all on the sand. ILGPP is a place with wonder inhabited by interesting characters with compelling stories, her stories. The mood is calm, but intensely focused on the day's activities. The music is chill, often sourced from Gina's playlist, and is always on point, underscoring the heartbeat of a cinematic moment. And yet, as wondrous as this island is, I doubt that Gina would call it a paradise, at least until we get through the director's cut. On any given day, if you were flying over, you might feel a jolt of turbulence, as if a tornado and a hurricane are at odds. But it is the energy that is inevitable and necessary when forces of nature are coming together in search of clear skies. This is an island for dreamers, but only those who are willing to work for their dreams, work hard, edit hard. Well-marked paths may be washed away in the storms of discovery and exploration. The hesitation of the unknown is never an option because your fearless leader, Gina's focus, is determined, unwavering, and committed. She knows her way and will get you there where you need to be. When you get to the end of the journey, it is a vista you could have never imagined. Our view is better for her vision. Countless audiences have benefited from this island's exports. Gina's magic is ever present, and it is why I will stay on this island for as long as I am welcome. She is my compass as much as I am hers. She launches me in directions I could only dream of. She gives me the faith, the trust, and the freedom to deliver my best self in our work together. She is my director, my fellow cinematic warrior, my sister from another mother, and my love and gratitude is to you always. Thank you. Hello, everybody. This is such a wonderful, emotional, happy occasion. Um, and in that same clip that we saw, uh, Gina says something very poignant because we are living in this reality show world. But she says it takes an artist to make reality what life is supposed to be. So I really think that we should celebrate the artistry of Gina. And I'm so glad everyone is here to share that this evening. Our next guest is someone you'd want to invite to your Thanksgiving meal every Thanksgiving. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, just watch Master of None episode, which she wrote and acted in. And in real life, she's a jack of all trades, master of everything. So please help me welcome Lena Waith. Like y'all came to win tonight. <laughs> Woo! Um, wow. Um, well, first, I'm happy to be here. Um, one of my greatest titles is uh, Gina's former assistant. Okay. Yes. I got. I, you know, I, I know all the truth. I know where the bodies are buried. Um, Look, I uh, first I gotta give Mara Brockakeel a shout out because I wouldn't have had the job were, were it not for her. She called her assistant called me one day, and uh, it's funny. Um, I wasn't I was working at Girlfriends, but I wasn't like working directly under Mara. But she like saw me running around like you know a field slave, and was just like, <laughs> you know, you you got what it takes um, to be Gina's assistant, I guess, because. Her assistant called me, it was like, yeah, you know, Mara's best friend, like, is looking for an assistant during a post on Secret Life of Bees. And I was like, like, who's her best friend? She's like, Gina Prince Bythewood. Of course, that's Mara Brockett Hill's best friend. Um, the woman who wrote Love and Basketball, the first movie I was able to see alone by myself as with all my friends when I was 14. Uh, got it. So I went over to the house, the lovely house, okay? The Bythewood Manor, as I like to refer to it. Um, in Encino, uh, you walk in, the Love and Basketball posters right there, Dancing in September is right there, okay? You got biker boys, and I'm walking there like, hello, like still growing my dreads out, like, hello, hi, Lena, uh, lovely to meet you. But she basically said, look, 
Uh, Mara recommended you. She's my girl. I'm just making sure you're not crazy. So uh, uh, the job is going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. You're going to work. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, and uh, be on time. That is Gina's thing. If you admit it late, you're late. Um, so, so yeah, so, and so the journey began. Um, and, uh, I stayed long after the Secret Life of Bees was done. But I, I do have a, a story that I tend to tell people and I figured I, I'd tell it tonight. So, what, the first week, all right, my first weekend, I'm at the house and she casually says to me, um, Lena, so can you, uh, get Whoopi Goldberg on the phone for me? I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. W uh, hit me the number and I will get her on the line. She's like, I don't, I don't have the, I don't have a number. I'm like, oh, you don't have a, you don't have a number. Yeah. Get her on the line. Thank you. So I'm like, oh, and here we are. Devil Wears Prada, the black version. Okay. So. <laughs> So I go into one of the guest bedrooms, there are many, um, and I'm in there and I'm like, okay. So I decide to call, because she was working at the view at the time, I call ABC, just straight up ABC. I Google ABC <laughs> network. I'm like, hi, um, hello, hi, sir. Got somebody probably named Tyrone something. Uh, sounded like he had a gold tooth, it's cool. I'm like, I'm trying to get a, a hold of, I, I, I know Whoopi's working on The View. I know you're ABC. I know this is crazy. I'm trying to get Whoopi Goldberg on the phone. You and everybody else, click. I say, okay, cool. Let's try another method. I call, I call back. I say, can you connect me to The View? He's like, yeah, cool. Get that. Now I'm talking to somebody. Like, Welcome to The View. Okay, we can look at a step further. Hi, I'm trying to get a hold of Whoopi Goldberg. You and everybody else, bye. Okay. Call back, get the guy, get me back to the view. I got, okay, I'm working for Gina Prince Bythewood, okay? And he goes, uh-huh. I'm like, she did Love and Basketball. Oh, yeah, 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 that's my movie. <laughs> I'm like, okay, got you. Okay, brother, okay. So then I learned very early on, when you use Gina Prince Bythewood's name, you're going to get somewhere, okay? Use the name, use the credit that they know. I'm like, okay, got it. So then, so now he's like, okay, cool, how can I help you? I'm like, I'm trying to get to Whoopi Goldberg. Okay, I'm like, does she have a cell number? No, she ain't got no cell phone. Whoopi don't carry a cell phone. I'm like, okay, uh, well, how, what do I do? He was like, um, but she do got an assistant. I was like, okay, is he around? I don't know who he is. I don't know his name. I know she got an assistant. I'm like, okay, cool. Can you connect me to some? Okay, I'll connect you to the view, the producer office. I said, okay, thank you. I'll get there. We get there. They say, yeah, we got a number for him. So I get the assistant on the line. I say, I'm look, trying to talk to Whoopi Goldberg. He hangs up on me because I didn't get to say Gina Prince Bythewood because the name is long. I go back through, I get it back, he picks up again, I say, sir, brother, okay. <laughs> uh, you can tell by the voice, I'm black, let's just work together, sir. <laughs> I'm working for Gina Prince Bythewood, she did love at basketball, I used to run a different world. She's a black person, she's a director, she's a black woman, I'm a black woman. I'm trying to get a hold of your boss, who is also a black woman. And it's a legend. Her name was Whoopi Goldberg. He's like, oh, yeah, okay, cool, yeah. Um, uh, what, who are you? I'm like, I'm her assistant. She's like, okay. He's like, let me call you back. I was like, okay, let me give you the office number. So now I, I hang up. I'm sitting there. Lord, please let this man call me back. Like, literally 10 minutes later, phone rings. Pick it up. He's like, yo, I got Whoopi. You got Gina? Yes, I do. Gina, I have Whoopi on line one. So I tell that story, you know, uh, sometimes I tell it at dinner parties, you know, depending on who's there. But the, the moral of that story, as they say, is that there is nothing I cannot do. With a little bit of help, a little bit of resource, a little bit of swag, I'm going to get there. And, um, and I think the thing I learned, you know, working with Gina, a lot of things, a lot of sayings, you know, be great was always the thing she would say, never take no for an answer. 
um, you know, fall down seven times, get up eight. Uh, you know, and these are things that, you know, I remember constantly. And it wasn't just Gina. I mean, Reggie would send me emails like, literally, this is the crazy thing, you know. He would say like, I, uh, can I be your mentor? Can I, one day you're going to win the Emmy, ain't that crazy? I'm like, what, Reggie, what, it's three in the morning. Why are you sending me emails? What? <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. But like, the, the thing about, you know, Gina is that people always say, oh, what does she teach you, this and that? And I would say, but here's the thing, it's like, she didn't need to necessarily give me anything. She didn't have to hand me anything. She didn't have to like say, Lena, do this, then do that, because she always led by example. She, you know, she would be kind and gracious whenever people, even when people weren't being kind and gracious to her. Um, and uh, she would always play the long game, which I've learned to do. Because um, especially as black people, sometimes we gotta fall back, do that. Okay, all right. You're gonna be sorry later, you know. So, <laughs> so I learned that, you know, by watching her, and um, you know, and I think a big thing for me is, you know, Gina went from being someone I looked up to, you know, just from afar as a person in the world. She then she became my boss, and being my boss, she became my friend, and now I consider her to be my family. Um, I, I love you, I love the Bythewood family, I love you guys so much, and I wouldn't be standing here, you know, without you. And I know people can say, you know, I'm an actor, I'm a producer, I'm a writer, but it all really began in your office and at the crib, getting whoopee on the phone for you. Uh, <laughs> I, I love you so much and I wish you the best and, and thank you so much for giving, you know, giving me a shot and giving me a chance, letting me, you know, watch you up close and personal. It's been the greatest movie I could ever write. So thank you so much, I love you. I'ma just put this out there, they did not save the best for last. <laughs> That's not what they did. Um, <laughs> secondly, Terry, clearly you did not edit that video up front because it missed the story where Gina was like, I'm walking away from Beyond the Lights if you guys don't give me Aisha Hines. I was like, Gina, that's not really required. Like, you know, um, not, not a true story. Anyway, <laughs> um, I'm delighted to be in this room. I'm delighted to be here um, in a collective that is singing the praises of Gina Prince Bythewood. Um, Gina Prince Bythewood is truly from a different world. See what I did there? Um, <laughs> She is one of a kind. She is the only one of her kind. On one Thursday night in 1992, she set it off in the homes across America when her episode of A Different World aired. Then on another Thursday night in 2017, just one day after we finished burning our fingertips off at the final live tweet of Shots Fired, it is announced that Gina Prince Bythewood, Bythewood is the first African-American woman to helm a big budget superhero, superhero film. <laughs> Alas, here we are yet once again on a Thursday night in the middle of NBA finals, <laughs> giving Gina all her due respect for entering the game, enduring the game, and truly elevating the game with every play she makes. Gina does a magnificent job of assessing the game, identifying the strengths of her team, empowering each individual's talents, and setting us up to make the shot. And if we miss, please trust and believe she's going again. <laughs> once a baller, always a baller, evidenced by the fact that once again, she's the first African-American woman to helm a big budget superhero film. But this skill set on and off the court is a valuable quality, a discipline and quite possibly a conscious and subconscious strategy that has served her well thus far. Gina Prince by entered my life and my home without asking. <laughs> I let her in without asking her name. She was just welcome because she brought people and stories that reflected and inspired me. I watched the world she helped craft and curate on the campus of Hillman and delighted in the feeling that a collection of characters all shared my thoughts, my longings, my emotions, my humor, and my joys. 
I never paid attention to credits before or after the show because I was too captivated by the opening swipe left imagery introducing each character and too consumed with singing along with the theme song. In such, I was oblivious to the fact that Gina Prince Bythewood had snuck into my life and planted a seed for what would later become my purpose. Once I began to walk in my purpose, becoming an artist, I retraced my steps to see where it was we actually met. Though I have had the wonderful opportunity to work with Gina on Beyond the Lights and recently Shots Fired, I wanted to know where this woman came from in my consciousness and where we really actually met. Love and Basketball was was the movie, was the one that stopped me in the credits. This world was the one I fell deeply in love with, like so many others, and I wanted to meet the lady behind the lens in person. I wondered if she had a magic way of looking into the eyes of a person and knowing their story and then telling it. My admiration only grew as opportunities to touch the soul of her Jordans eluded me time and time again. <laughs> One time being my own fault when I spotted her, being a normal human being, walking out of the mall at Sherman Oaks. <laughs> I was like, this is your time, Aisha. But then I was like, little girl, what you gonna say to this woman that will make it worth her time to stop and listen or even say something back to you? But thank God for destiny setting us up to meet on common ground. My introduction to her would be the same as her introduction to me, the work. Once we both entered the world together, our conversations would grow as would a deep respect and affection for one another. I'm glad I didn't interrupt her at the mall because <laughs> Gina is a woman of few words at times, yet one whose words we can't get enough of on the page. A woman who speaks volumes through her work and whose silence holds amplified depths of intrigue and insight. Her seasons of silence leave you longing for her voice. What a blessing it was to have Gina, widely known as a film purist, offer her voice to television again in this last season. She rallied a dedicated and diverse army of directors alongside husband Reggie Rock Bythewood and graced the small screen community with 10 beautiful, bold, brilliant hours, packaged with a purpose and unflinchingly titled, Shots Fired. In both opportunities I've had to work with Gina Prince Bythewood, she has challenged me to be a better human and a better artist. Every project I walk away, I walk away built for more and made better than the time before. I stand in this room honored to be listed in the credits of your legacy. And I look forward to continued growth evermore. We love you, Gina. All right, all right. The estrogen level is heavy up here tonight, okay. Uh, before we move on, I want to thank a few people who helped put this thing together. It took a while, actually. It took months and months, actually, maybe a year to put this together. Uh, the African American Steering Committee, please give them a hand. <laughs> DGA staff, Ruby Cinder. Where's Ruby? She's still here? Okay. Uh, our co-chairs, Jeff and Courtney and John Singleton, who's not here. Also, Reggie Brown, who's up in the booth. Redelia Shaw, Super Stage Manager, Anthony Kennebrew. And uh, I thank Gina for allowing us to come into her castle. And uh, we have uh, Anna Marie Horsworth, who did the interview, as well as Michael DiLorenzo, who did the voiceover for the clip package. And also, you know, there was a lot of people who actually wanted to be here who could not be here this evening. So we have a little digital love we want to show you. So let's, uh, let's roll the clip.
Okay, it is, it is my privilege in welcoming tonight's moderator, who is an actor, writer, director, producer, the legendary Robert Townsend. <laughs> and I'd like to bring to us the stage our honoree of the evening, our own Wonder Woman, the one and only maestro Gina Prince Bythewood. One more time, Gina Prince Bythewood. Come on, come on, come on. Please have a seat. What an amazing evening. Oh my God. Uh, can, can, can we give a round of applause to all the speakers that came up tonight? Give it up. Oh my God, what an amazing, e how do you feel? I mean, all this pouring of love. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> sorry, okay. No, I think I, when I was 16, um, a friend of mine <laughs> threw a surprise party for me and, and three people showed up and <laughs> it oh. scarred me. Um, but tonight, the fact that you all came out to, to, Celebrate! Um, it's it's over. It's fixed. I'm good. You know. You know. Let, let me let me say this. Uh, you are an amazing talent. Brilliant writer. Brilliant director. You always raise the bar when you create your work. So you know. They, you know. They've been saying so much. When I when I watched that first reel, I was like, What are we gonna talk about? You said everything. But. Tonight, I just really want to start with your creative process, because there's a lot of writers, directors, producers in this room that want to do what you're doing. Uh, why do you do what you do? Let's start there. Why, why is this important? Um, why? Um, I, I, it's honestly as simple as there's stories in my head that have to get out, and um, it's just the only thing that I want to do, and, and I've known that for a while, um, to tell stories. It, it absolutely <clears throat> helped me growing up in just being so shy and um, just being by myself. I could disappear into books. I could disappear into a television show or a movie, and to be able to then be able to create and put out in the world what's in my head is just such a, a blessing, and I'm so lucky to be able to do that, and um, I think it's as, as simple as that. But, but I mean, here, here, here's my thing. Do we have a responsibility as artists to say something? Like you and Reggie always layer your work. There's, there's layers in this world. Why is that important? <clears throat> um, I mean, it's just for Reggie and I, it is just, it's just a part, I think, of our makeup and, again, what brought us together, this belief that art can change the world. Um, it's As artists, you want to entertain, absolutely, but the fact that we have a platform, it, it just seems like a responsibility to use that platform in a positive way, and it doesn't have to always be as deep as some of the things that we did, like taking down Different World with the Riot episode. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> You know, I think in everything that you do, I think it's just better um, to say something. Talk to me about that man right there, Reggie. Talk to me about him. Okay, so now I learned that you met in the writer's room and you guys worked late hours and you did a lot more than writing. Um, My kids are here. They're the kids are right, right there. <laughs> so there was sex involved, S-E-X. So talk to me, talk to me about your, your, your working relationship. How does it work? How does it, how do you guys, because here's the thing, uh, you are in Hollywood, you know, in, in the limelight, you are married, but you create this amazing work. How, how, do, how do you, talk about your working relationship. Well, foremost, um, on May 24th, we celebrated 19 years. Um, <laughs> So, um, I mean, I'm incredibly blessed, um, and our relationship and working relationship started at a different world, and, and the way that we just wanted each other to win, um, it really started there. There was no competition. It was just, he had something due, and 
was working to make it be the best it could be and, and absolutely vice versa. And, and that work ethic too of, of, you know, being the last ones there and the first ones there. Um, and it, it's just about trying to push each other to be better, to be harder on each other than anybody else, because we know once it goes out into the world, it's not protected anymore. So um, having the courage to be blunt with each other. Um, Reggie is harder on me than anybody. Um, and it makes the work better. And then also to, you know, to be married, to be in love with the person that you respect more than anybody. Oh, he's just sitting there like this. <laughs> That's my baby. You know, as an artist, I mean, I'm I'm truly blessed, and you know, I really hope that our boys. I don't know why you're looking shy. Uh, you know, that our boys are picking that up as well. Just the mutual admiration and belief in each other. Talk to me about how you write. How, what's your creative process like? I mean, do you have a cup of coffee? Or do you listen to certain music? I mean, how do you? What's what's your ritual? Yeah, music is everything. Um, I actually, some people love writing. Writing is very, very hard for me. Um, it is, it's hard. Writing is hard and it's lonely and it's, it's self-doubt and it's um, constantly questioning, does anyone even want to see this thing that I'm spending, you know, a year on? Um, so, and I'm, you know, I get very uh, into myself when I write and, you know, uh, as opposed to directing where everything is, it's just a totally different personality. So, but writing each script I do, I create a playlist and um, it's just all songs that I feel speak to what I'm going to be writing. Give me a playlist like for Love and Basketball. Love and Basketball was Lauren Hill X Factor was on repeat. Um, and also uh, Felicia, uh, I don't write to Kenny G. <laughs> The truth uh, comes out. I, write, I do write to Enya. Enya is, ah. is great. So she, she, she got the artist wrong. Um, <laughs> I'm not ashamed. Um, yeah, just, just music. It gives me something to look forward to, and it opens me up emotionally. And character, doing all the character work is, is hugely important. Um, just these pages of super specific stuff so that the characters become real. And honestly, it's I want it to get to the point where they're actually speaking to me. And so I can be at the computer and just be typing, and I don't know where it comes from, but it's because of that work, because of a great song on, because of the character work I did. And, and the characters will start to speak to you, so you'll know that they should say this or not say that or yeah, leave it's, the room. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a very, I know it sounds crazy, and I think my son, I said to him today, and he said, that means that you're crazy. Um, <laughs> But they really, that's the point. Whether if I was on the court playing ball and you're in the, the zone, it's the same thing with writing, getting in that flow where you don't know where it's coming from, but it's, it's just coming. Wow. Let's talk about casting. Um, Robert De Niro has Scorsese. You have Sanaa Lathan. You guys have been doing amazing work, you know, for years now. What is it that you say to her when you're working with her as an actress? Because you draw stuff out of her. She's worked in a lot of different movies, but when I see her work with you, there's something different. What's your process with her? I have a joke to say, but I'm not going to say it. Say the joke. Say <laughs> no, it. No, I'm not. No, Sana, um, she... <laughs> she <laughs> she, she, she goes to be politically correct. She said some very nice things. No, we, she, she glossed over some some things um, for us. Our relationship did not start out great. Um, and I will put most of the blame on me. Um, Why didn't it start off great? <clears throat> <laughs> because I had said I would never cast someone who didn't play ball in the part of Monica. Oh, because okay. I play ball and I never wanted to put out in the world, you know, a movie where you didn't believe the basketball. I understand. Um, but as Sana said, she did the reading, and she was so good that I said I'd give her a chance. And uh, she trained on her own um, to, with no guarantee of the part. Um, and then at a certain point, she said, you know what, after I think a month, she said, this is kind of crazy. you got to hire me a... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It was more than a month. <laughs> so you out there shooting, dribbling. <laughs> I better get this shit. <laughs> I, I she, see. Um, you were torturing her, basically. Uh, mm, I don't like your, no, your jump shot's a little off. No, the it risk. was, 
it, uh, she said, and she rightfully so. Um, the truth is, I had I had a ball play. It came down to two people. Sana and a ball player who hadn't acted before, and Sana who hadn't played ball before. So I ended up getting Sana a basketball coach, who was a coach who coached at UCLA, and I got the ball player and acting coach. And so they were on these parallel tracks. I, I wow. see, yes, I know. It was my first movie. Um, and But I could not figure out. I kept going back and forth. Um, and at, it... I think it dragged into three months. And this is how, finally, it was funny, Stan, her father, <laughs> called, who was my mentor early on, he called up and he said, this is, this is ridiculous. And it's, I think he used more ch choice words. You better hire my damn daughter, <laughs> shit. You know who I am, I'm Stan Lathan. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he said what I was doing was, was not fair. And so I knew I had to make a decision. And this is how, bad it was, again, how when you're in it, it's all you care about. I took the, the audition tapes of Sanaa and this other woman to uh, Mara's bridal shower. And uh, after, wow. the, after the shower was over, I pulled her and Felicia into a room uh, and said, watch these. And, uh, you know, I just couldn't. And then, and then Reg and I just going through and watching, watching. And finally, I think it was, Reg said, what movie are you making? Uh, is it a basketball movie or a love story? And I realized at that point, it's a love story, and and I could fake a jump shot, but you can't fake a close up. And, and wow, and Reggie! <laughs> and uh, I went with Sana, but B Wood. <laughs> but <laughs> can you stop heckling? Um, but the the crazy thing was, so after this three month process of this. So finally, I make the decision, and I call Sana, and I'm like, <laughs> "Call say, okay, you got the part. I need you to, I need you to come to the office so we can talk." And she said, "No, I have something to do." <laughs> and uh, that's that's how. It's, so she was feeling damaged by the process, <laughs> and I that pissed me off. So it was a it was a very weird thing, but. As she, as then, she, then once you got on the set, what I mean, like the first day of shooting, where you like, hi. Uh, <laughs> that's what it felt like. No, because then once she got the part, then she, we were still dealing with the basketball, and I still was not sure. And I remember, I think two weeks before shooting, I came to watch her, and I was, t I watched her. I mean, we've talked about this, so I'm not talking out of turn. And I was like she's not good enough. And I totally freaked out and I pulled her aside and I said, you've got to work harder. You, I, I need you to walk around that basketball nonstop, 24 seven. You gotta be throwing it against your garage door. You gotta work on your passes. You gotta work on your shot. Like this is not gonna work. And she looked at me and I could tell she was about to cry. Um, and she just turned and walked away. And at that moment I was like, I'm the worst director in the world. <laughs> and, um, so don't learn from learn what not to do, um, but I, I went. It just wrecked me because I saw her face and I realized I was not inspiring her at all. And um, I ended up calling her, and we and we did talk. And I, I think I apologized. I hope I apologized. Did I apologize? <laughs> but but let me let me ask you a question. You know, did it make you want that part more and a better actress? She's joining our conversation. There's a mic coming for somebody. You're going like, I can't hear shit. Oh, oh, that's so cool. Um, so what, what I look at it, I, I, in drama school, I was taught that the director is king. There's no, there is no talking back. But I, she, Gina told me this wasn't a rose, but now I can tell the truth. I hated her. <laughs> <laughs> She was I know that. horrible to me, you guys. But I, when I look back, hindsight is twenty twenty. The actual experience of auditioning, which was, this is the word that she doesn't like, it was abusive. It wasn't abusive. It actually prepared me before I even got on the script, uh, on, the, on the set for Monica. Wow. You know what I mean? So, so that was like, layered into the character yeah. because, you know, we because call it's it like, substitution. If Monica is fighting to be, to be this woman, and I and I weirdly is like we, life is weird. I weirdly had to go through that to get the part, and so by the time I got on the set, it's like the work was done in a weird way. Wow. Yeah. 
And I will say that the great thing about it now, we're, we're great fans, and it came at the end of the film, and I think it was because Can I just of say one thing about you? So then, <laughs> wait, sorry. So this is, no, this is in tribute. Stan, you, help us, Stan. <laughs> no, no. Take, she's no. taking over the show. No, no. At the end, yes, it was a grueling shoot. At the end of the shoot, we were in Spain. It was like our last, I don't know, I guess she was happy by then with the dailies. <laughs> But one of the things that I love about her, and this is such a testament to her, you know, who she is, we were sitting in a hotel room one night, like, and talking about the experience, and she asked, she was like, how could I be a better director? She asked me that. And I was like, wow, that's really amazing. I had never had somebody do that. And we talked about it. I was like this and this. <laughs> no, but <laughs> no, but you know, you know, I got a question for you. You know, since you said that, you are an amazing director. What is your secret sauce? We got a lot of this. This, and let me say something to the uh, uh, African American Steering Committee. Thank you so much for honoring this woman. Give give them a round of applause tonight. So much, so much, so much. Uh, let's talk a little shop. What, you know, what would you say are your tools that make you a, a great director? Because like, 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 uh, um, uh, beyond, you know, um, the acting choices, everything is, you know, like even shots fired, you know, what's, what is your secret sauce? What is it? What would you say to directors out there to, to step their game up? Wow. Um, I think for mo it, it all starts with love of the craft. Um, it is absolutely a craft, and so when you love it, you you study it, and and you want to continue to improve, um, and a passion to tell stories. I mean, I start to direct when I'm writing, and so I start to see it in my head. Um, <clears throat> but the, I think in working with actors, one of the great thing I I have such respect for what actors do because I I don't understand it and how they do it, and the great ones like Sana, um, and Regina. <laughs> <laughs> you are a fool. You're brilliant. So, thank you. So thank you, Gina. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so it uh, respect for the for the actor, um, and I think casting as well. I mean, I think they said casting is seventy percent of directing. Um, when I'm writing, I usually put up pictures of my dream cast. Um, and then a lot of times it's about going after that, but it's also following your gut. Um, and that's something I learned absolutely in Love and Basketball because I, I feel like I knew it was her from the reading, but blocking it because of the basketball. And, um, but she, you know, she was the one. And, uh, with Goo Goo, um, knowing in my gut that she was the one. And once you know it, you have to hang on to that no matter you know, how hard it is, and, and a lot of times it is an a incredible fight to get the cast that you want, whether her, they're her, not. her and Nate Parker were amazing. Yeah. How, how do you look at actors from a casting point of view of chemistry? How do you, mm -hmm. because like Omar and, and Sanaa were amazing. How do you look for the chemistry? Mm -hmm. what, what is that? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a look. What, what, what's that look? Give it a thing. I mean, it, it's. <laughs> you know how we look, Robert. Um, chemistry is. Like it's an amazing thing. You have to, you can't fake it. You have to see that crackle. In their audition, it was there. I didn't actually know they were dating at the time. Um, and I don't know if that would have affected, if I would have, um, if that would have freaked me out or not in case they broke up in the middle and hated each other. <laughs> um, Google and Nate. Um, uh, Nate did me a favor when I had to audition Google for Sony and, and, and came in, but in the back of my mind, I, I wanted to see these two together to see if they had that crackle. And um, and that's the thing: if they have that crackle, then you can build on that. Um, and it's again, it's a it's a gut thing. Do I want to see these two together? And then once you see that, it's about building the chemistry. And and I love that part because that's rehearsal and that's improv and that's just creating really cool things to build a chemistry. Uh Talk to me about the scene, you know, the basketball scene. Um, was that the scene you wrote? What we, we, we see on the screen, that was the scene. Mm -hmm. But my question is, was that music? Because, you know, talk to me about how you pick, because that song is haunting. It, you know, it goes with the emotion. Uh, was that in your head before or after? Um, that 
was a really beautiful moment in terms of, you know, filmmaking. We were basically done with the film. Uh, Terry and I had score there. We could not find a song that would work there. Um, and we tried so much stuff. And the, th the great thing about Terry, Terry is so good at music and she loves music the same way I do. And she happened to bring in, uh, Michelle and Degocello had just released the album Bitter. <laughs> and she brought it in and we listened to it and fell in love with a couple songs. But Full of Me, it just felt like it spoke to it and we put it, we didn't make any edits or anything, we just queued it up at the top of the scene. And it was like it was written for it. It was, it was an amazing moment and we're running around screaming in the editing room and knew that we found it. And then the key was, was Michelle gonna give us the rights to it? And, um, and she did and thank God because that song, and I think Maxwell, um, Woman's Work, it was like two songs yes. that just elevated the scene. And that's what great mu music could but, do. But do you love music? I mean, will you listen to hundreds of songs to find placement in, your, in one of your films? Yeah, music, it drives Terry crazy a little bit sometimes because she'll say we need to focus on editing and I'd rather put a song to, to a scene. Um, it's, I love that part of it, of, of finding one, as I said, I write to music, then I direct to music, I play music on set. Um, like the, uh, in Mexico, with Beyond the Lights, that whole thing that was just, um, I put together a playlist, I asked Nate and Gugu to provide a couple songs that they felt spoke to the characters, and then that was just Tammy Riker, my amazing DP, uh, who does her on camera. It was me and Tammy, Nate and Gugu, and that's it, locked in the motel room, put on that playlist, gave them a blueprint of where to go, and I love doing things like that because it, it brings out the emotion and reality, and um, and so, you know, in the same way with the editing room, edit to music and, and have songs constantly playing and constantly trying to find that perfect song um, that j and you know it when you hear it. Talk to me about Shots Fired. You got, you're working with uh, Richard Dreyfus. you're working with Helen Hunt, uh, and you're back with, you know, your muse over there. Uh, now as a director, what's your approach? Has it changed since you started over here with the after school special? What, what, what's the new for you as you, as you walk on set now? I think, I think the new is, I mean, with each movie you get more confidence. Um, like early on, uh, with Love and Basketball, uh, the first rehearsal between Alfrey and Sanaa, I mean, I was like, what am I gonna say to Alfrey Woodard? Um, and I remember they did a take of the scene and Alfrey wasn't, it wasn't right. And, but I was too scared to tell her and I said, oh, that, that, that was really good. Um, <laughs> and Alfrey looked at me and she said, no, it wasn't. Um, and, and she said, now I can't trust you. And it just oh. so freaked me out. But it was the perfect thing to say because I realized you, you, can't, you can't lie to your actors. The trust that you have between them has to be sacred. They have to be able to trust that, that, that they can trust their performance um, with you. I mean, that I'm, I'm the person that's telling them whether they're good or bad or not. And um, so never, never lied, I don't think. I've lied to an actor again after that. You know what, our time is about up, but I, a few things I want to do. Can we turn the house lights up real quick? Because anybody that's been uh, a crew that has worked on any of the films yes. and projects, please stand up. Yes. Anybody that's worked with Gina on anything, crew, cast, everybody Nina, stand up. up. Please stand up. Please stand up. Because it takes a team to make a movie and all the team that is here. The one last thing I'd like to do, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. There are three people that I'd like to, to bring on the show just to say the final few words, and it's these two gentlemen in the front row and Reggie. Come on up, come on up. You gotta say something. This is the night. Come on up. Give it up, because it's a family affair. Let daddy go last, let daddy go last. Come on. Come on. Look at that. I love it. I love it. Look at him. All right. Say a few words to your mama. How did... uh, well, mom, thank you very much. I know that sometimes it's hard for you uh, when you have to leave, you know, to go shoot a film. But I appreciate it when you always, you know, call or FaceTime us. 
and everything's, uh, you know, you make us feel better about it. And uh, we really love you and we support everything you're doing. So thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, I love you, Mom, and thank you for being so supportive, and I'm really proud of you. So before Reggie says anything, give him a round of applause, because this is a dynamic duo here, dynamic duo in the house. So a trillion years ago, you had more than writing in that writer's room at a different world on your mind. I'm just messing with you. I'm just messing with you. But, 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 you know, you've been a part of this amazing evening tonight. All this love for your wife. Give us your thoughts about tonight or whatever you want to say. Um, Rob, remember when I saw you in the elevator and I thanked you for doing this? I take that back. <laughs> um... I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm inspired by, you know, I, I feel like I'm supposed to do this thing, and oh, I'm sorry, you know. Um, let me just, just say I'm, I'm inspired by Eugenia, um, and I also want to say, because Gina was like, nobody's going to show up, you know, and, and, and I just want to say, you know, to everybody, um, I was moved to see so many people that were here from the beginning. So, um, yeah. you know, just thank you. Thank yeah. you all for, for being here. Yeah. Okay. okay, we're not done. We're not done. We're not done. We're not done. I wish this could go on. I could, I could listen to Robert and Gina talk forever, and I wanted it to. But, Gina, let us, at the African American Steering Committee and the Directors Guild of, of America, because it's all of us, it's the DGA, it's the, the African Americans, it's the Latino committee, Asian committee, and the women's committee, all involved in this. So it's not just one, it's everyone. And we'd like to present you with this award from us, from us to you. And thank you for all of your prolificness and to be a beacon in this world, because you inspire me every day and you inspire everyone in this room. And more than you know, I told you this in the green room, more than you know, because you, you just like to present yourself as such a, a regular human being, and you are, but you're also a shining light that we all can aspire to and shoot for. And I thank you for allowing us to honor you tonight, because that meant, that meant the world to us, and it meant the world to everybody in here. And look at all these faces that showed up tonight. We filled, we filled the theater. Theater one is filled for Gina prince Bythewood. Everybody stand up and thank Gina prince Bythewood for being who she is. And guys, I just want to remind you, there is a reception out, so please enjoy a little drink and food. Thank you all for oh, oh, coming okay. and supporting, oh, oh, guys. Uh, 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 before we go, can we have all the panelists come up so we can take a photo Absolutely. to, you know, Absolutely. to honor this? But thank you guys so much for coming out and being a part of this. And Jeff Bird, thank you so much. The, the African-American Steering Committee, one more time, and one more round of applause, please. One more round of applause.